Coming up, uh, I just learned from Debbie that um, O.J. Simpson died. Uh, not that I plan to talk about O.J. per se. It did, it did um, cross my mind. I wonder what, where O.J. is now. And I, I suspect he's having a lengthy conversation with his maker. Um, what I am going to talk about, I, I, um, I'm going to outline the emergence for the first time of a global right across the world to counter the baleful influence of the global left. So very good news. Brazilian journalist Paulo Figueiredo joins me. We're going to talk about how Brazil has essentially become a dictatorship under the guise of democracy and how this process was aided and abetted by a globalist elite. Hey, if you're watching on Rumble or listening on Apple, Google, or Spotify, please subscribe to my channel. This is the Dinesh D'Souza Show. <laughs> needs this voice. The times are crazy and a time of confusion, division, and lies. We need a brave voice of reason, understanding, and truth. This is the Dinesh D'Souza Podcast. I've been covering this showdown between Brazil, the uh, Supreme Court Justice in Brazil, Moraes, and his battles with Elon Musk and with X, um, and a prominent journalist named Paulo Figueiredo Filho, Filho, of course, just meaning junior, reached out to me. And uh, he's like, wow, your, um, your uh, coverage of Brazil is really appreciated and people in Brazil are paying attention to it. And he said, if I can ever be of help. And I was like, yes, you can, because this is an important topic in its own right. But it's also an important topic because of its implications for the United States. There are some startling, almost eerie parallels between Brazil and the United States. And so I have Paulo Figueiredo. Uh, he uh, is in Florida and he's going to be uh, joining me for a conversation uh, after this uh, after this segment. But as I was thinking about uh, Brazil, I was thinking about um, Jair Bolsonaro and the, um, the Brazilian election. It occurred to me that there's a big change that's coming about in the world. There is, of course, the, the global left. We often talk about the globalists, the global elite. But this global left is very old and its ideology is very old. Uh, there may be modifications to it. The global left um, 30 or 40 years ago is focused on building bigger welfare states. Uh, it was also focused on revolutionary left-wing uh, activism, very often against United States involvement uh, in foreign countries. So we can put the Vietnam War uh, in, that, uh, in that bracket. Uh, and this was the left, but there was a global left. And if you went to different countries uh, all across South Latin South America, for example, you'd see it. What there was not at that time was a global right. Now, there was a right in America. This was the Reagan right. Uh, and it was mirrored uh, to a large degree in Great Britain, where, of course, there was Margaret Thatcher, Thatcher was essentially a, a female version of Reagan. No wonder the two of them got along fabulous because they were cut from the same cloth. They had both kind of come up in the world from very middle, lower middle class origins. Uh, they had both um, had a very similar view of the world, anti-communist and foreign policy, pro-market or capitalist and economic policy, a certain kind of a no-nonsense approach to social uh, issues like crime and so on. Uh, both of them are against the hippies. And uh, so the, the American right was matched by the English right. But if you went anywhere else in the continent, you found that the right was completely different. Now, yeah, there was and is uh, kind of an old French right. But the idea of an old French right winger is something like a, a count. You know, some guy who has like lost his aristocratic power, uh, believes that democracy is a sham, believes that markets are a joke, doesn't like uh, capitalists or merchants, considers them to be uh, the, the very people who usurp the prerogatives of the aristocracy. So this is the kind of guy who wears white gloves 
and uh, doesn't like to talk to people and is, quite frankly, in the modern world, a bit of a weirdo. Uh, and this is and was the European right. And you'd find these kinds of guys all across uh, Central America, people who claim to be descended from the Habsburg Empire. I remember one guy who kept showing up at the Heritage Foundation who claimed to speak like seven languages. And, and in fact, he couldn't even have a conversation without going from one language to another. And he'd be like, pardon me, I've, I've, I've broken into Slavic or pardon me, I've accidentally, I'm accidentally speaking German without knowing it. And we would be like, this, is, this guy is just... This guy doesn't fit in in any way with the American right. But, uh, and then if you, go, and if you went to uh, Central and South America, the choice was either the left-wing revolutionaries, the Marxists, or on the other side, you would have these, well, there were sort of tin pot dictators, these Caudillo dictatorships run by people like Pinochet, who were in no American sense right-wingers. These were just thugs. These were military guys. They had taken power by force, often by overthrowing some elected or purportedly elected leader, uh, and they would run the country as if it was their own private possession. So this was only right-wing in the left's imagination, but not right-wing in a sense that William F. Buckley or Reagan or anybody else would meaningfully recognize. Today, however, let's survey the global landscape. We have, in the United States, of course, we have Trump. Um, in Argentina, uh, we have Javier Millet. Now, Millet is a lot like Trump, a lot like Trump in ideology, but he's a lot like Trump in personality. He's over the top. He's outrageous. He will give it to the media. So when you see Millet, you're like, wow, that guy, with a little bit of fixing uh, for his English, that guy could run for office in the United States. Then you listen to Giorgia Maloney in Italy, another person with a kind of a obviously strongly anchored in, in Italy itself, but that's what it means to be an Italian nationalist. Uh, Gert Wilders. Uh, there is an Australian right that is emerging, and it's now recognizable. These are the people who don't want to take the COVID vaccine, and these are people who don't like the Australian government's inclination towards censoring, quote, misinformation and disinformation. Uh, I'm actually talking to some guys in Australia. Debbie and I might be doing a tour in Australia to talk further about some of these things, but again, with a, a recognizably similar agenda. Nigel Farage in Great Britain. Let's look at Nagib Bukele in El Salvador. Look at that guy. Uh, he suddenly emerges. Uh, his agenda is very simple. Dis defeat and destroy the gangs, and let's make El Salvador the kind of most peaceful place in the world. And he did it. He's done it. Now, initially, it looked like Bukele was just doing that. That was his agenda. He's a single-issue guy. He deserves credit for what he's done. But there is no broader ideological significance to it. But no, Bukele then starts talking about God uh, and family and patriotism and the idea of the individual. I saw recently he's put out a, a notice that El Salvador is offering all kinds of incentives for really smart and capable people, distinguished scientists, uh, entrepreneurs, people in all leading walks of life, even, even in the arts, to move to El Salvador to enrich the country. And Bukele goes, we're not going to take people randomly who just kind of wander into our country, but we do have room, but we're going to make sure we get the best people, people who, uh, who will not only flourish in El Salvador, but they will be good for the other people who are in the country. And notice how this is one of the great missing elements of our immigration policy. We never ask, what are the immigrants going to do for us? How are they going to make our country better? Uh, Bukele is asking that kind of question. So he, I would count as part of the global right. Uh, Bolsonaro, of course, in Brazil. Now, Bolsonaro is out of power. But I noticed that since I've been talking about Brazil, I look at my, my ex, um, my Twitter, and uh, when I click on followers, I see all these Brazilian names, one after the other after the other. So they're now following me. Why? Because I'm linking the uh, issues that are going on in Brazil with issues that are going on in the United States uh, and elsewhere. Look at Pierre Paul Avery in Canada. Who's Pierre Paul Avery? I don't know if you've seen the social media clip of the guy eating the apple. This is the Canadian leader. He's eating an apple and some journalist comes up to him and starts asking him questions. 
questions like, you know, well, aren't you really a, a Trump guy? And he's like, well, what have I said that makes me a Trump guy? Well, you're kind of like Trump. How am I like Trump? So the apple eating guy who with plain spoken, simple kind of counter questions reduces this journalist to absolute idiocy and, and, and garbled pulp. Um, this is the conservative who is going to be running against Justin Trudeau and is in fact leading in the polls. So the good news, and we, we have a lot of bad news these days, bad news in America, but also elsewhere. Uh, the good news is that there is a, a counter movement, a countervailing force, and it's not, it's a powerful force. And it's picking up steam all around the world. And what I think is really fascinating is that these the global right is now linking up with itself across national borders. This may seem a little paradoxical. How can people, how can the guys who wants to make El Salvador great again, and the guy who wants to make Argentina great again, and the guy who wants to make Great Britain great again, and the guy who wants to make America great again, it would seem like, well, they've got four different agendas. They're all working in the interest of four different countries. No, they're all working in the interest of patriotism. They're working in the interest of the individual of the family, of the church, of the local community, and very exhilaratingly also of freedom. There's a very common sense reason why gold is pushing to all-time highs right now. Debbie and I were looking at our the price of the gold that we own, and we're like, whoa, we're actually doing pretty well. So there's several reasons why gold is doing well. The cost of goods continues to rise despite interest rate controls by the Fed. Since January 2021, cost of living is up 17.9%. That's inflation. The national debt continues to skyrocket, now over $34 trillion. Very bad, causing a lot of people to worry, when is this house of cards going to come crashing down? we got a presidential election this year that will have huge implications for the future of the country. So all of this adds up to instability, uncertainty, and that's why a lot of Americans are turning to Birch Gold Group. Have you diversified your savings yet? You should secure a portion of them with gold from Birch Gold like Debbie and I have. Text Dinesh to 989898. Get your free information kit. A no obligation, just information. You'll learn how to convert an existing IRA of 401k into a tax-sheltered IRA in gold, and it doesn't cost you a penny out of pocket. Birch Gold has an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau, tens of thousands of happy customers. You can count on Birch Gold. Just text Dinesh to 989898, get your free information kit, and begin to protect your savings from uncertainty today. The most difficult thing with weight loss, getting started. And there's no better time than right now to call our friends at PhD Weight Loss and Nutrition to begin your journey to a healthier you. As I hear from many of you about how PhD Weight Loss and Nutrition has changed your lives, I know each of us had our own reason for starting. I started because I was feeling a bit sluggish, a little tired. I'm like, let's get it going. Debbie tried everything else, nothing would work, so we just needed some help. I heard from one viewer who went for his yearly physical. He was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. The medicine was making him sick, so he's like, let me try PhD instead. He has completely reversed his diagnosis. Debbie talked to a lady who just like her couldn't get the menopause weight to go away and Dr. Ashley and her team helped her lose the weight and keep it off. So the best thing about this program, they have an 85% success rate of their clients maintaining their weight loss for life. They provide elevated maintenance support for you through the PhD alumni community. The PhD alumni community will provide you with the support you need to keep this weight off forever. So Let's get it going. Call PhD Weight Loss and Nutrition today. Here's the number, 864-644-1900. Well, you can go online at myphdweightloss.com. The number again to call, 864-644-1900. Guys, I'm delighted to welcome uh, to the podcast a new guest, someone I've followed on social media. His name is Paulo Figueiredo. He is from Brazil and, in fact, joining us uh, from Brazil. He's an award-winning journalist. He's been censored by the Brazilian Supreme Court. He's an expert on Brazil, on Latin American projects. He's also appeared on a bunch of programs, including PragerU and Tucker Carlson. You can follow him on X at Real P. Figueredo, F-I-G-U-E-I-R-E-D-O. Paulo, thank you for joining me. Uh, really appreciate it. 
And uh, this stuff that is happening in Brazil, I think, is fascinating in its own right, but also has a larger significance for the United States and for the West. Uh, I'd like to begin by just talking about what is going on in Brazil. We hear about this uh, censorship of uh, opposition journalists, dissidents, uh, leading figures in the opposition party, I'm assuming in the Bolsonaro orbit. Now, uh, who is the guy who is doing this and based upon what authority? It's a very interesting question. Uh, thank you for having me, Dinesh. I've been following you for so long, such a big fan. You do such an amazing work. Uh, your, uh, believe it or not, your documentary, The 2000 News, uh, had a huge impact in Brazil. Uh, we, we watched it closely uh, uh, as we have different but very serious concerns with our elections as well. So it's, uh, it had a, a very big impact. In fact, I'm speaking to you from South Florida because if, if I was in Brazil, I would be in prison right now. That's how bad things are. Until uh, 2022, I had the I, I was on regular TV, cable TV, on the number one show um, in in the news TV in Brazil. Uh, we had very uh, very high ratings and viewership. Uh, I I made this joke uh, laughing uh, with Tucker Carlson said saying that I used to beat him most days, so we used to have more viewers than him. So that's how, that's how big our show was, and uh, that was until December uh, uh, 2022 when this justice that now became famous uh, thanks to Elon Musk, um, he ordered the uh, block of all my social media in Brazil. And we're talking about roughly 5 million people that used to follow me. Um, he ordered the, the my bank accounts and financial assets to be frozen. And uh, he uh, also uh, issued a fine every time I said something. And, uh, a few thousand dollars every time I said anything that it disagrees. And um, the last and not least serious measure was to cancel my Brazilian passport. The reason he did that is that he couldn't arrest me since I was here in the US. I've been living here for for a long time now. Both of my daughters are American and uh, I'm an immigrant like you. Uh, so, and, and now we're, what the, it's becoming public something that is has been ongoing in brazil for uh since 2019 so immediately after jair bolsonaro our donald trump the brazilian donald trump as people often uh, uh calls him uh, he as as soon as he took office the supreme court of brazil decided to do a very weird thing. So just to give you context, Brazil has been on the hands of the left for many, many years, at least since uh, 1994, 1995. And um, Lula was present for two terms. Then his successor, Dilma Rousseff, was president as well. She was impeached by defrauding, uh, for defrauding public accounts. Uh, and then, and that's what we had a, her vice president uh, for a short period, and then we elected finally our first conservative since my grandfather. My grandfather was also president of Brazil from 1979 to 1985, so he was the last conservative until Jair Bolsonaro. Then we had Jair Bolsonaro immediately after he got elected. The Supreme Court, which is composed by uh, 11 judges, 11 justices, out of these 11 justices, nine of them were appointed by Lula or his allies. Okay, just just to give you an idea on how how bad that is, and uh, so they decided to open an investigation against fake news. So that might sound weird for a lot of reasons. The first reason is, well, what the hell is fake news? Is there anything on Brazilian law uh, about fake news, uh, defining fake news? No, there, there's nothing about that. Uh, but the other thing. Uh, that's very weird is that usually in the Western world where the accusatory system uh, prevails, courts don't open investigations, right? The Department of Justice, uh, the, the accusators, <laughs> the the prosecutors, they open investigations. But, and in Brazil it's the same way. We follow a very uh, similar structure of government. It's a republic, 
with a, pr a presidential republic with three branches, independence, uh, Congress, two houses in the Congress. This is very similar. And in Brazil, yes, by the Brazilian law, only prosecutors can open investigations. But there is an exception. And this exception exists in the U.S. as well. When a crime is committed within the premises of the court, the court can't open an internal investigation. And you've seen that happen in the U.S. when the Roe v. Wade uh, overturn was leaked and they opened an investigation internally. So in Brazil, they were very creative, as the left usually is, with the law. They, they decided to say, well, people are slandering Supreme Court justices, meaning criticizing uh, Supreme Court justices. Some, some, some of the critics uh, were truthful, some were not, and that's life, that's how uh, democracy works. And, and they decided to, instead of like, you can, they could file a lawsuit in regular court for anyone slandering them. Slandering is, is, um, is included in Brazilian law, but they decided to do something different. They decided that they could, uh, they said, well, this is being done on the internet. So if it's done on the internet, it's done everywhere. So it's if, if it's everywhere, it's in the court as well. So therefore, we have the authority to open this investigation. Wow! And the, <laughs> yeah, the first thing they did when they when they when they done it was to censor an article published on a mainstream media, media magazine about how one of the justices were involved in corruption. So that story was censored. But then they used this as as a vehicle to persecute and not not exactly prosecute but persecute any conservative and what we i can better explain it but what we have been seeing for these past years are journalists like myself being persecuted uh, we have at least five journalists brazilian big journalists here and next side of the u.s comedians uh we have uh several businessmen some of them billionaires they had their homes raided, all supporters of Jair Bolsonaro. We have a we have a member of the Brazilian Congress in prison for nine years for recording a video, uh, uh, like very harsh video against uh, this justice de Moraes. And, we, and during the elections, uh, we got to the point, and I can better explain, but this is like the airplane view of that. During the elections, before I get into my show, I used to get court orders saying, you can't say that about Lula, you can't say that about Lula, you can't say, like, for example, Lula was convicted for corruption, okay? He was convicted for corruption for two uh, levels of the justice, the first degree and the second degree, um, by a panel of judges on the second degree. Then he was convicted by a third degree, which is the superior of courts of justice. Brazil has four tier system. And he was, so he was convicted by several judges for corruption and money, bri uh, money, money, uh, bribery, money laundering. Uh, so the court, the, the, the same nine Supreme Court justices that he appointed or, and his friends appointed decided to nullify uh, to uh, his conviction uh, because of a procedural uh, reason. And, and to be fair here, I think they had a good point. But that was not, they just found an excuse to uh, make him uh, able to run again. So, and, and I couldn't call him, so instead of saying that he was found not guilty, I used to say that he was unconvicted. So we used to call him unconvicted. It's, it's, it's a, of course, it's a way of playing with words, but I couldn't say that. I got a court order saying you can't say that. <laughs> really? Like, what? Really? It's true. Well, yeah, yes, it's true, but it may, uh, it's truthful information that may mislead the public. I was like, wow, I've never heard of that. The public is smart enough to, to decide what. And uh, I couldn't say that he was an ally of um, Nicolas Maduro. I couldn't say that he was an ally of Ortega. I couldn't say that he had a very harsh position against Christians. I couldn't say that he was, uh, was uh, very lenient with the drug cartels. And all that proved, just like, since he took office, all that happened. He was like, first thing that he did was receive uh, Maduro, a narco-terrorist sought by the Department of the Justice of Justice of the United States. And he, he got him and received him uh, in Brazil. So that's the level 
of uh, the censorship that has been ongoing in Brazil for quite some time. And the weird part, and, and I think you're going to find this very interesting, is that the United States government went out of their way to empower the Morais during the elections, meaning it's, that's a public fact, it's not a conspiracy theory, don't worry, that was on the Financial Times. Uh, the Department of Justice sent the CIA director, the, 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 the Secretary of Defense, the advisor for uh, uh, foreign affairs of Biden, they all went to Brazil to exert pressure on the Brazilian on Brazilian military leaders and officials to not challenge the election results in case Lula won. And we can also talk about it, but that's that's the case in a nutshell. But now everyone knows what's happening because of Elon Musk. Hey, let's uh, sorry, let's take sorry a pause. If I talk too much. It's it's a big story. Not at all, Paolo. Let's take a short pause. When we come back, let's delve into it in more detail uh, and trace out some of the implications for us here in the United States. You might have heard Mike Lindell and MyPillow no longer have the support of their box stores or shopping channels the way they used to. They've been part of this ugly cancel culture, and they want to pass the savings directly on to you by having a $25 extravaganza. Now, when Mike started MyPillow, it was just a one product company, only the pillow. But with the help of his dedicated employees, they now have hundreds of products, some of them you may not even know about. So to get the word out, I want to invite my listeners to check out their $25 extravaganza. Two-pack multi-use MyPillows, $25. MyPillow sandals, $25. Six-pack towel sets, $25. Brand new four-pack dish towels, you guessed it, just $25. And for the first time ever, the premium my pillows with all new Giza fabric, just $25. Orders over $75 will get free shipping as well. So the amazing offer won't last long. Take advantage of it. Call 800 876 0227. Again, that's 800 876 0227. Or you can go to mypillow.com to get the discounts and the free shipping. You got to use the promo code. It's D I N E S H Dinesh. Guys, if you'd like to support my work, I'd like to ask you to check out my Locals channel and consider becoming a monthly or an annual subscriber. I post a lot of exclusive content on Locals, including content that is censored on other social media platforms. On Locals, you get Dinesh Unchained, Dinesh Uncensored. You can also interact with me directly. I do a live weekly Q&A every Tuesday, 8 p.m. Eastern. No topic is off limits. I've also uploaded some cool films to Locals. I've got Dinesh's movie page up there. 2,000 Mules is included. Also, the last film, Police State. I'm working on a new one for the election. And if you're an annual subscriber, you can stream and watch the movie content for free. It's included with your subscription. So check out the channel. It's Dinesh.Locals.com. I'd love to have you along for this great ride. Again, it's Dinesh.Locals.com. I'm back with journalist uh, Paolo Figueredo. You can follow him on X at Real P. Figueredo. He's an award-winning journalist. He's been censored by the Brazilian Supreme Court. I erroneously said he was joining us from Brazil. He's actually joining us from uh, Florida. Uh, Paulo, you know, when I when I think about what's happening in Brazil and in uh, the United States, there seem to be eerie parallels because... As you mentioned, Bolsonaro is a figure who in his charisma and in some of his, uh, his, his ideas, his agenda, resembles Trump. Uh, Lula has been a sort of solid uh, leftist and is supported by leftists in the United States. Um, there was controversy over the presidential election. Uh, not only that, but Brazil appeared to have its own January 6th, uh, which I guess was January 7th. Eight. So was it January 8th? Yes. January 8th. Uh, and then in the aftermath of Lula uh, taking power, you seem to have a escalation of the assault on civil liberties, very similar to what we see in the United States. In fact, I think the Brazilian situation is even worse because in the United States, the arrests have been mainly, not exclusively, but mainly January 6th defendants, people who went in the Capitol on January 6th. But it looks like in Brazil, they are locking up people for misinformation and disinformation or on various other pretexts. And as you say, they're defining misinformation so broadly that they're not just talking about whether you made an error in, in saying that Lula was convicted or unconvicted. 
but you're making truthful statements about his allies and they don't want you to say that not because it is false but because it's true you're absolutely right there there are so you elicit some parallels when we see the twitter files brazil we see that everything that was happening in the u.s meaning uh you you had government officials uh putting pressure on social media companies to m mold the social discourse and and the debate on the society so they wanted some stories to be uh, shadow banned, some people to be shadow banned, some people to be removed. That in the U.S. was done informally by the deep state. In Brazil, it was done officially by the Supreme Court. And 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 that's the way I put it, Dinesh, is that we, we got the same virus. We just have different immune systems. And the U.S. is like that guy that used to be an athlete in, in, in high school or in, in college. And now he's he's been drinking too much beer and 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 maybe he's not in the best shape, a little bit of belly, but still, this is, this is a strong guy. Brazil is an old lady with nine years old, all underlying conditions you can imagine. So the immune systems react differently, but the idea is the same. What is the idea? So the way I see is that after the populist, you can call it national populist, conservative populist movement uh, started in the 2010s, You've seen Bolsonaro, you've seen uh, Orban, you've seen even uh, Macri in Argentina was kind of like the, the same thing. You've seen uh, Trump, of course, the Brexit. You, you saw the conservatives gaining strength and the separation between that old type of like center uh, establishment Republicans being dominated and, and and going away to to give place to these actually patriotic uh more excited and more conservative um, electoral base. So the left noticed that, well, they lost the monopoly of the facts because of social media, and they they blame the rise of these guys on social media. So that's what they did. And you could see that in the US was ridiculous, right? First they said, well, it was it's Russian misinformation. Then, well, it was all because of social media and then you had the the cambridge analytica scandal and all that and you saw that and you can trace to 2021 the first time you saw even democrat politician uh talking about combating disinformation to protect democracy you can you can track that and you start seeing the first profiles being removed back then from social media and you saw all the 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 networks the platforms updating their pl terms of service that, that's that was like that wasn't heard of before 2020 2019 that wasn't heard of and so that's the virus spreading because until then i would say that in the western world free speech was like a settled matter I was like, well, we we settled that. Everyone has a right of free speech. Since we started this 250 years ago, and we finally settled in the mid 20th uh, century with the De Universal Declaration of Human Rights and all that. So that was that was the idea, right? Um, and then we start seeing this ch these changes. And and in the U.S., you you have the Democrats using the same language, the same terms. The legislation is different. The First Amendment is so well written and so strong, and American society protects the First Amendment so boldly that they couldn't do what they wanted. But if they could, they would. They would do the same exact same thing. So a question that I ask you, Tanash, what do you think? It would happen if you had five out of your nine Supreme Court justices appointed by the left. They would do the same thing that's happening in Brazil. So sometimes Americans think, well, this is a banana republic that's so distant from us. We are not. We're very culturally similar. Of course, we're different, but we're very culturally similar. We have a very com uh, similar structure of government, and we both caught the same virus, which is... Uh, they found a way around the democracy system, the democratic system. And one of these ways is through the judiciary. Because think about it. If you're a billionaire and you have two ways to, and let's say you have a, you want to make the society more open, okay? It's like, you get it. You want to make the society more open, you have two ways. Well, one, you, you, you can 
on campaigns for congressmen. It had to elect a lot of members of Congress. And then there's the Senate. And then there's a check and balance. And there's a judiciary on top of it with the uh, judicial review. This is very tedious and hard. Lots of checks and balance. And I, exactly what the founding fathers wanted. Uh, but then if you have judges and the judiciary, and they have the judicial, they have the final word. And they don't, they're not, they don't, they're not, they don't have to follow the law by the letter anymore or by its original meaning. The law can be a living constitution, a living body. So what's a living body? Well, times change and we want progress. Okay. So all you need is to control the people that are on top with the judicial review, and then you control the world. And that's called juristocracy. And that's happening in America as well. That's why Soros is funding campaigns for DAs and judges more than for candidates for, for the parliament. So, and, and like I said, very similar. I live in the middle of both worlds, so I can see what's going on. And I, mean, I think Paolo, Brazil is a cautionary tale. Yeah, I mean, to, to uh, italicize what you're saying and really support it, I found it really interesting that when this guy, De Moraes, writes, when he, co when he communicates or his office communicates with X, with Twitter, um, it would be one thing if they were to say, hey, listen, there's all this false information. We have declared it to be false. We take credit for banning all these people. So please announce that my, by, by my decree, we're going to get all these guys kicked off of Twitter. No, it's very interesting that he said, listen, I'm telling you to kick all these people off of X, but it, sh it should appear like you, Twitter, have made the decision. In other words, it should appear like they have violated your regulations. Now, what does that tell you? What it tells me is that in Brazil, as in America, this is a little bit of a secret operation. And by secret, it cannot openly state its goals. Because if it did, it would make it too obvious to the Brazilian people, as to the American people, that, well, we're living under a kind of a dictatorship. If we have a committee that is an arbiter of truth, and they can not only ban, but in some cases lock up or go after, persecute, as you say, people who are going against them, then the whole meaning of democracy is a sham. I mean, remember, we've had lots of sham democracies in history. The German Democratic Republic, which was, a, which was communism in the old Soviet orbit, it called itself the GDR. It used the name democracy, but it wasn't a democracy in any meaningful sense. Do you think, Paolo, that there is a move uh, led by globalist elites occurring across the world to convert democracy from what it used to be, civil liberties, checks and balances, power to the people, into something very different, which is to say a certain type of tyranny imposed from the top, but using the fig leaf or the rhetoric or the camouflage of democracy to impose in various countries across the world a kind of new form of autocracy or dictatorship, but an autocracy that pretends to be the guardian of democracy. You're absolutely right. And most uh, dictatorships, they pretend they're democracies. Most people don't know, but uh, the constitution of China uh, protects free speech. Uh, China has elections. Cuba has elections. Venezuela uh, supposedly has elections. They all pretend they're dem democracy. You're, you're absolutely right. Most dictatorships in the, in the the 20th century used to have the name democratic and and uh, on the name of the country to pretend they were democracy. So the word does it doesn't mean anything to them. It's just uh, a, a a pretty word that can uh, can allow them to do whatever they want. And what we what we are seeing is exactly what you described. Is a, is a global or a globalist uh, alliance to at least end free speech. And we saw that very, very intensively during the pandemic. That was very intensive, but it's happening all over the world. Germany has passed legislation uh, regulating free speech. Canada, I, let's not even start with Canada. Canada is a, is a mess. Uh, Ireland, the, the, even the European Parliament, um, and you've been seeing more and more of that all over the world. The Democrats tried to pass something similar in the U.S., but they couldn't. 
If they could, they would. And that's what I keep telling people. Wait, if Donald Trump loses the election and loses the House and the Senate as well, you you go the same way. I have no question about it. It's a matter of how and 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 what speed, in what pace. But you definitely end up in the same place as we are. Look, Dinesh, five years ago, if you told me five years ago this was happening, I would say, nah, get out of here. In Brazil, I would say, get out of here. Now, nah, Brazil has a very long tradition with free speech and all that. It's so never going to happen. And now it's happening. And a, a large chunk of the population, it's the minority, like one third, still supports Moraes for what he's doing. So, you know, people, the cultural aspect, as you know very well, has a has a has a strong uh, weight on this. Yeah, I mean that we have to concede, and this may come as a surprise to many people, that tyranny is appealing because you know it's appealing to be able to use arbitrary power against your political opponent. So if somebody else is doing it and you happen to be on that side, you're going to cheer. So for example, lots of people in the United States will cheer the idea that Donald Trump is going to prison. And even if you push them and say, let's say that you can't really get him for something, are you in favor of like just using any pretext to just lock the guy up so he can't be on the ballot? Oh yeah, I support that. So that tells you that tyranny has a constituent Guys, I've been talking to Paulo Figueiredo, award-winning journalist uh, who's been censored by the Brazilian Supreme Court. Follow him on X at Real P. Figueiredo. Paulo, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me, uh, the National Brazilian people. Really appreciate it. I'm continuing my discussion of Abraham Lincoln, the Lincoln-Douglas debates my book of reference that I'm drawing on but also responding to is Harry Jaffa's Crisis of the House Divided. And at the heart of Lincoln's political philosophy is the Declaration of Independence. And not merely the phrase in the Declaration that is all men are created equal. That was very important to Lincoln that you can see the direct bearing of that idea on the slavery debate but also consent of the governed, consent of the governed, because Lincoln realized that you have a problem when the governed do not consent to all men are created equal. So in other words, there is the potential inside the declaration itself for some conflict or tension between the beginning and the end. Now, it's been an interesting question for a lot of people who go to law school and who study political or legal philosophy. What is the relationship of the Declaration of Independence to the Constitution? When was the Declaration of Independence adopted? 1776. It was the charter of emancipation, you might say. We know about the Emancipation Proclamation signed by Lincoln, but the Declaration of Independence was a kind of emancipation proclamation for America from Great Britain. And it was, um, it was uh, written, drafted by Thomas Jefferson, then approved, uh, and then issued. Now, the Constitution came much later. 1787 to 1789 was the constitutional debates. So over really a decade later, more than a decade later, we have the Constitution. And there are some people who argue that these two documents are unrelated. They are uh, for different purposes and they are different kinds of things. So the, the Declaration of Independence is a sort of a revolutionary charter, a exhortatory a doctrine, a we uh, kind of a we're not going to take it anymore proclamation. But that's it. Uh, it's a revolutionary statement and important in that respect. But it's completely different from the Constitution, which is a, a legal manual. The Constitution is a set of not um, just general uh, affirmations or declarations, but rather the Constitution is a set of, of codes. Uh, of rules. Uh, it lays out a structure of government. It assigns responsibilities and powers to Congress and to the executive branch and to the judiciary. So according to this school of thought, 
The Constitution tells us how we should live now. It is our guiding manual. It is our supreme law of the land. And the Declaration, well, it historically precedes the Constitution, but it doesn't really do anything for or with the Constitution. Now, it should be emphasized that nothing could be further from Lincoln's own view. Why? Because Lincoln's view is that a Constitution is a, a letter of the law. But a letter of the law, by the nature of it, is going to, number one, create ambiguities. Uh, in other words, you have general terms that need to be interpreted. So the Constitution, in other words, is not self-interpreting. Somebody else has to interpret it. But interpret it how? Interpret it in what light? Moreover, there are many questions that, are, that come up that might touch upon constitutional principles, but the founders didn't have anything like this in mind. And so the question then becomes, how does a Constitution, a general document, in fact, relatively short, how does it illuminate the massively complex set of questions that could come up, some of which would be completely unanticipated by the people who drafted that document? Now, for some people, uh, there is no answer to this question. You just have to kind of, well, do your best. Do your best and take the Constitution, uh, try to excavate certain general principles out of it, uh, and apply them to new situations with as, as much creative fidelity uh, as you can. But you can see that this can become an extremely um, uh, troublesome and fraught process. Why? Because we all have our own ideological assumptions, prejudices, biases. So it's very tempting for judges to say, well, the Constitution kind of means what I think it should mean. I wasn't a founder, but if I had been, I would have put, you know, an abortion right in there. So even though it's not really in there, I'm going to sort of read it into that. Now, what, what Lincoln had to say about all this is that with law, you have the letter of the law, but you also have what could be called the spirit of the law, or to put it differently, the, the conscience of the law. Uh, Montesquieu wrote a book called The Spirit of the Laws, and in that book, Montesquieu tries to show that laws don't just have a, a wording, they also have a spirit. And what the spirit of the law tells you is, what was the, the motivation of the law? What was its kind of guiding idea? What was its, um, what was its animating spirit? And, um, and for Lincoln, the Declaration of Independence is the animating spirit of the Constitution. Or to put it differently, the Constitution is the letter and the Declaration is the spirit. The Declaration is kind of the conscience of the Constitution. How? Well, the Declaration is going to tell you where the Constitution wants the country to go. So let's take, for example, this question of slavery. The founders, says Lincoln, allow slavery but not because they like it. They allow it because they have to. So there's a difference between the principles of the Constitution and the compromises of the Constitution. A principle is where you actually want to be. This is what I believe. A compromise is this is where I don't want to be, but at the same time, I do want to get a union, so I will provisionally agree to this, but my goal is for this not to last very long. So it's kind of like, you know, your your 30-year-old uh, kid, your 30-year-old son wants to come and live with you. And you're like, well, this is probably not the best arrangement, but guess what? You're out of work, so I'll let you do it, but you need to be looking for a job. So what's the principle? The principle is that this is my house. <laughs> this is Debbie's in my house. Uh, we're going to allow our grown children to occupy it for a while, but let's be very clear that that's a compromise. That is an adjustment to an unfortunate situation. In reality, what we're aiming for is ejection, <laughs> freedom, uh, emancipation, living on your own, proving that you can support yourself. So that's the goal. That's really what the job of a parent is, is to prepare their children to be independent in a sense in life. Well, I only use that by way of analogy. So for Lincoln, the purpose of the Constitution uh, is to realize the principles of the Declaration. For Lincoln, it's understood that the, f the founders will have to make compromises, but Lincoln's view is over time, 
there's going to be change. Now, not random change. We don't have a living constitution. You don't steer the document wherever you want. There are certain provisions uh, like amendments to the constitution for the constitution to change in line with modern developments. But for Lincoln, the real forward way for the constitution is you might say backward and what i mean by that is the way for the constitution to know where it's going where the country is going is to constantly look back to the declaration 10 years earlier and see what is it that we are really trying to achieve here answer we are trying to fully realize a vision for a society where you've got citizens of equal moral worth and equal rights striving in an atmosphere of freedom and opportunity to realizing what we all call the american dream subscribe to the dinesh d'souza podcast on apple google and spotify or watch on rumble youtube and salemnow.com